You're listening to Finding Your Genius Zone with Dirk Novell. With the help of successful individuals across industries, Dirk breaks down the unknown parts of every vocation while highlighting the importance of finding a career where you can leverage your natural skills, passions, and interests. Now here's your host, Dirk Novell. Hello, welcome to the podcast. This is Dirk Novell, and on with me is a close friend of mine, uh, Matt Wimmer. And before I hand it off to Matt, I'll give you a little introduction. Matt is a guy like, and I, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. There's nobody like Matt. And like, I want to be known as different. Like, I don't want to be normal. And mm. so this is a compliment. But like, Matt is one of the most unique and impressive men I know mm. on a lot of fronts. And I feel honored to be his friend. Um, I met Matt, I actually met his wife first. Um, and I had the, uh, she was in college with me and I had the chance to travel with her and we became friends and we ended up working together. And then that was my introduction to Matt. And when I met Matt, we had a lot in common. We were both athletes. Uh, and just, I think we were both just good guys. And, you know, I really liked him. He ended up becoming my financial advisor. <laughs> and what's so cool about his story is like when this whole thing is about finding your genius zone, like what makes you shine? What gives you fire? What makes you happy? <clears throat> and Matt is one of those guys who did a 180 and and I really think it's a it was very brave but I know that he probably thinks it was his path and it probably is his path but I was really impressed with what he's done and I'm going to let him articulate and break out what he does mm -hmm. but he is the CEO of a Bible camp that I actually was part of as a kid and some of my best memories growing up was going to Sambika and you know when I think of people that are in their genius zone doing their life work Matt is the guy that's at the top of the list. So Matt, welcome to the uh, podcast. Oh, thank you very much, Dirk. I'm very excited. Um, you know, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, you know, I, you were the athlete, you were, you were the good guy. I don't, I think I was just, you know, the average Joe hanging on your coattails, but this is going to be good stuff. So I'm excited to talk about career, um, you know, especially at those early stages and how do you get ahead? Um, you know, versus not just your peers, but for yourself. So this will be good stuff. I didn't play D1 college baseball. You did. <laughs> so I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so let's, you know, I say CEO of Bible camp and I say, Matt, but everybody calls you coach. And that's really what you are in my, in my mind is you're a coach. You're, you know, teacher coach. You are helping people live lives that are more joyous. And I know there's a spiritual component, of course, which we can get into, but if you were, uh, you know, you just got back from Israel. So let's just say you're sitting up in first class and Cindy's in the back and you have someone sitting next to you and they're like, Hey man, what do you do? How would you, how would you break that down? Yeah, we definitely weren't in first class. <laughs> Thankfully, Cindy let me sit next to her. Uh, we've been married for 28 years, happily married for 28 years. You know, it, actually, we were sitting ne uh, next to a young man uh, who was traveling by way of Seattle to Vancouver. And that's exactly the question he asked. He's like, well, what do you do? Well, you know, I run a summer camp, basically, you know, is what I shared with him. How in the world do you get into that business was his question. And it was awesome, you know, because my route was very different than the, the majority of people that get into the camp industry. You know, as you alluded to, my route was really from the financial sector in the business arena. And we can talk more about that transitioning into camp. But really, I think for those younger years, what we talked about is it's all about discovery. It's all about guesswork. You know, you're obviously trying a lot of times just trying to survive. You know, how can I live, you know, on my own? I'm no longer living at home with my parents. You know, how do I do this? Um, and what I talk a lot about with a lot of our young staff is, you know, here's the three big decisions that you're going to need to try to figure out ASAP. And the sooner you figure these out, the further along you'll be, you know, especially when you get into your 30s. And that's really first off is where are you going to live? So, you know, couch surfing is an option, but let's see if we can get a little bit something a little more stable, even if it's finding a house with a bunch of buddies. You know, uh, my oldest daughter right now is exploring that with, you know, about five or six girls, you know, and, and she hasn't quite graduated college yet. So, but they're already, you know, trying to figure out 
where, where are we going to live? Where do we want to live? You know, where, where are those places we'd like to be? And then career, which is obviously what we'll talk more about is what am I, what am I going to do to, you know, be gainfully employed? And I'm excited to talk about that because if a young person is early on can figure out uh, a skill and that's the key. If you can learn a skill, you will serve, you know, I mean, you'll serve Kings. You will not serve obscure people. So it is really about gaining the skill set, um, finding out what are your strengths. We can talk a little bit more about that. And then the last thing is the relationships. And, uh, you know, if there's a gal, you know, or a, a guy that, you know, it, the two of you are just syncing up, you know, and there's a genuine friendship and an attraction, you know, don't delay that. I mean, you know, I mean, really dive into that. And, and early on, I think, uh, again, like I just expressed earlier, 28 years of marriage with Cindy. She's my best friend. I adore her. I cherish her. We got to go out on a little date last night, just a little tiny little Mexican restaurant way off the beaten path, you know, and I was just thinking, man, she's prettier than ever. She's more fun than ever. I'm really, really thankful that I pursued her at a young age. And now we've really kind of gotten the chance to grow together. So yeah, I, I, how's that for a, a setting it, to start things up? It was great. You cut out for a second. There was a bit of a freeze, but uh, I heard everything coming through. Perfect. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, okay. we'll, we'll touch on like careers. Like sometimes it's not just about you. It's about your spouse or your partner and buy in, you know, whether you go down this road or that road, but like Cindy and Matt in terms of like strong, I mean, they're, they're amazing. And like I said, I met Matt through Cindy and Cindy is just, she's gold. So, uh, but both of you are very lucky to have each other. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. I mean, let's let's just dig in a little bit about on on just the lifestyle because you call it a career, but I almost would call it a lifestyle. And let's talk about you being a CEO of a Bible camp, an established Bible camp, but a Bible camp that you've actually uh, I don't want to say tweaked or changed, but you know you put your stamp on it for sure. You've improved it. You've made it better. Um, I guess I'm curious, like going from being a finance guy into a Bible camp and running that is a 180, which I would think at your age, when you made that transition required a lot of bravery. I know God was your CEO guiding you on that, but talk to us about just what's it like to run a camp? Like, I mean, people think they might know what that's like, but there's probably a million things that people have no clue on. So maybe you can share some things about the not so obvious. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and no, um, I don't even know I, hey, what Matt, I was getting myself. You were you were freezing again on me. I don't mean to uh, stop you. Uh, can you can you hear me? Okay, you there? Yep. I I can hear yeah. you just fine. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know. I just want to make sure we don't go yeah. six. Um I can hear you just fine. Can you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. For some reason you're so starting about, to how about freeze it. audible just like that. Yeah, okay. So I, I just want to make sure because you're throwing gold out. I don't want to like have to redo it. We can do it, but I just want to make sure if you're having a, a connection <laughs> issue, uh, I want you to be aware of. So let's try that again. I apologize. I know you were in a rhythm and I cut you off. No, that's perfectly fine. I think, you know, I remember early on when we were just coming on board, one of the employees asked me, you know, do you know what you're getting yourself into? Or do you even know what you're doing? No, I don't know what I'm doing. And now 13, season in, 13 seasons into it, I still don't know what I'm doing. Um, but the two words that I rely on, just as you, you were mentioning, is thoroughly equipped. And you're exactly right that I kind of think of God as that CEO, and I just talk with him every morning about, hey, how, how are we supposed to do this today? So, you know, the story is, you're exactly right. I was in the financial world. Uh, I became a registered investment advisor, actually started uh, several different uh, entrepreneurial ventures, uh, had a registered investment advisory firm uh, in, in the city of Bellevue prior to coming to camp. And as uh, Dirk alluded to, you know, my wife and I do the same thing. We pray a lot, uh, ask God's guidance uh, each and every day. And there was a particular morning where we were both reflecting on a portion 
uh, from a letter for, written by Paul to a guy named Timothy. And in it, it talks about living a life that is truly life. And Cindy and I were like, wow, that, that's what we want to do. We want to live a life that's truly life. Let's aim towards that. And it was that very day that uh, someone called and said, hey, would you consider taking on Sambika? Sambika had a great history, um, actually is now 104 years young. So it's been around for a while. And um, sorry about that. But, uh, oh, okay. so, so I didn't say no. I didn't say no to the call. Uh, we knew that Sambico was in a phase that was that was struggling. We we supported the camp. Cindy was a camper at the camp. Uh, it was transformational for her uh, as a teenager, um, you know. And uh, not to go too far into it, but um, she had lost a brother. Uh, her family had lost a brother to leukemia, uh, and so uh, you know they had a they had some hurt, some hurt that they had gone through. And the camp really provided a place of just love and and acceptance and encouragement, you know, that really, really was meaningful for her. So she really has a soft spot for Sambika, you know, at a teenage pivotal kind of time of life that those teenage years. Um, so when we got that call, uh, I almost forgot, I almost forgot about the call. And I said to Cindy, oh, by the way, I got this crazy phone call today, you know, from Sambika and they were asking if I'd come on as executive director. And with tears streaming down her cheek, she says, Matt, that's what we're supposed to do. That's exactly what we were reading this morning. That's what we were you know, praying about this morning. That's what we're supposed to do. So that's how it got started was, you know, okay, I have no idea how this is done, um, but there's an intense love for it. And I think, you know, as we think about, like, like you said, as we're thinking about what is it that we're going to do, finding that zone of genius, you know, in, in our careers, do we love it? Can we at the end of the day go, oh, today was a great day. I loved it. That doesn't mean we're not going to have bumps along the way, but our, do our hearts swell within us? You know, at the end of the day, we're like, oh, it might have been a difficult day or a tough day, but oh, that felt so good. That, that was, oh, what great stuff. So I think that's a huge key. And I can absolutely say that's now what I experience daily, you know, serving here at, at the camp. So so, you know, my son went, my daughter went, I went. In fact, my first year was with your wife's brother. We were okay. in the same room, Rob. And uh, like, like Matt just echoed, like those were very transformational mm. experiences for me in terms of just, mm. it was a tough time. I had a tough dad and, mm. you know, getting away and just, you know, learning about God and, singing and just being in a very loving environment is really, really healthy. And it was really, it was different for me, but there was something about it. I'm like, I really like this. So mm. I kept coming back every year. I would fall in love with someone. And I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know if God was uh, angry at me for that. I should have focused more on the, the words, not the girls, but um, anyways, it was a very, it's an amazing place. So is, you know, again, getting back into the lifestyle, I mean, it's it's a lifestyle like you live there. Um, what are some of the not so obvious things that like maybe you've been in it 13 years? What are some of the things that have thrown you like in a way like, whoa, I did not see this coming. Mm. Are there are a couple things because if somebody wants to choose a career like this, I mean, I think it's important to get really clear on behind the scenes and what it's like. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it is a lot like farming in a way. I mean, you know, you're up at the crack of dawn, you're, you're, you know, up late uh, at night. Um, you know, you're obviously taking care of a significant, uh, you know, size property of, of which a million things are going wrong. We have 33 different structures on the property. So, um, so it's a lot like farming and there's, you know, no, there's no day that's boring. That's for sure. Um, I think for me, though, what immediately popped into my head when you asked that question of what I was not prepared for was um, getting in between uh, really kind of domestic issues. And what I mean by that is uh, families that, you know, have, have you know, uh, parents maybe have separated. Uh, maybe one of the parents um, is deciding to send the child to camp. And oftentimes it's not necessarily agreed upon. And and un unfortunately, too often the child gets in the middle. And so I think I don't think anything could have prepared me. I, I still don't think anything 
uh, has, has me, I mean, I have to rely again on those words being thoroughly equipped. And, and often uh, as I get, find myself in the middle of those scenarios, I'm just trying to uh, really support the child in, in the whole thing. Um, obviously be respectful to both uh, of the parents, um, but help them realize that just like you said, you know, this week could be the very pivotal week that saves their life, you know, as they're able to unpack uh, whatever it is maybe that they're holding inside their hearts um, with loving counselors that genuinely do care about them. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a forum, it's a setting where children can finally get maybe some answers to some questions. And, and, and maybe they, that doesn't mean they're all going to be, you know, flowers and butterflies and rainbow type, you know, uh, answers, but at least maybe they can get some maybe truth to some things, uh, especially in those domestic issues. So I don't think anything could have prepared me for that, but I do find that uh, there, there seems to be lacking a place for youth to unpack, you know, like uh, tonight, uh, we will actually host uh, probably about 70 to 80, uh, 20 something year old men. And uh, we have a, a gathering, we call it Men of Valor. We're gonna teach them how to grill steaks. Um, but after we learn how to grill steaks, you know, we're gonna open it up to hot hot topics. And, uh, you know, man, it, there, it just creates a great forum for guys to be able to unwrap stuff. Uh, Monday night, we have a great gathering called uh, Rooted, and that's for young men and young women. So we uh, have uh, mostly college age young men and women, uh, a lot of them from the University of Washington, but other surrounding colleges as well. And again, it creates a forum and a setting for them to, you know, uh, really discuss a lot of life's issues. Um, we will have a biblical topic on Monday night. And the biblical topic is, you know, was Jesus resurrected and why does it matter? And so just creating those kind of forums for students to talk. It's interesting. I had an email from a camper mom this morning and we have a spring break camp next week. And she was saying, can my child be removed from the Bible oriented uh, part of the program? And my response to that is, you know, like, look, they're going to hear stories about Joshua you know, breaking down the walls of Jericho and 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 Moses and uh, and Noah and the Ark and David and defeating Goliath. You know, and how many of us in our life right now face Goliaths? It'd be really great if we could learn how you know to defeat the Goliaths that are in our life. You know, so there's so many applications to real life by reading about the biblical heroes and stories. But she wants the child removed, and so my answer is just, you know, look, it's. Well, one thing, it's always odd when a child gets removed. I mean, I doubt her daughter wants to be that kid who's separated from the group. Um, but further, I mean, it's just going to be this wonderful kind of gathering amongst peers. And again, it'll be facilitated by, you know, a loving counselor, two loving counselors, but it'll be a facilitated discussion around with peers talking about, for example, what are those Goliaths that you're facing in your life? And how are you, you know, overcoming those things when it seems like all odds are against you? I mean, talking about an amazing time. And I said, so here's, here's what I guarantee for you. I said, uh, statistical averages nationally for meaningful conversation between a child and their parent is only three minutes. Three minutes a week, three minutes a week that a parent actually has meaningful conversation time with their child. And I said, here's my guarantee. Whatever yours is in your home, hopefully it's better than three minutes a week. But whatever it is, it'll triple. It'll triple. And yes, they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about all these biblical characters, you know, but what parent doesn't want meaningful conversation time with their kid? So I said, I hope, I hope, I hope you'll allow the child just to stay within the little cabin. But if not, we totally understand. So anyway, that, that's a long winded answers again to the things that I'm not ever quite prepared for. Um, but again, I think my hope is always, I'm always going to the heart of the child and, and believing like, what, what is it that they need? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking like, you're almost a parent of like the responsibility of, I mean, I don't know how many kids when it's fully loaded are there, but you know, you have three of your own, you and Cindy, I mean, now you have, you know, a thousand children, like, you know, it's like Jesus or Santa Claus. I mean, you have all these kids and then the responsibility of like even getting the message of the counselors to trickle down 
the right way. It's not like it's you to everyone. You have to have everybody on board. And it's not like you guys are, I mean, you're talking about deep stuff, right? And sometimes, con, you know, parents don't like it, or maybe they want, uh, it's a lot of, I can imagine it's very difficult, especially in this day and age with everything that's going on, but you seem to really do it well. Why do you think you do it so well? Is it, I mean, it, you're a humble guy and you have a lot of skills and you're very likable and lovable and you know kids gravitate towards you mm. you have a strong faith but like if you were to take the humble hat off mm. what is it about matt that makes you so good at this <laughs> i mean i honest i don't I don't know if it's me i i think it's a i mean i, w- I would defer it and say it's a full-on team effort um you know, I think the only thing that really makes me unique, if it is even unique, is like we talked about, is just starting each day, uh, starting each day in that conversation uh, with God. And and that's not meant to sound holier than thou. Anybody can do it. It's just that's how I choose to start each day. And I, I actually do believe that it gives me, provides wisdom. I, I believe it provides knowledge on how to make decisions when difficulty comes comes at us. Um but, you know, one of the things we love to talk about is that our motive is love. Our motive is love. And so, you know, we, we would welcome all different, you know, uh, opinions and all uh, different uh, um, kind of uh, approaches. You know, so our motive is love. And then we love to say our language is play. Uh, so we just we just, you know, again, love the love the mix it up with the with the youth i mean even tonight's deal when we're all done we're playing pickleball it's like whoever wants to hang out and stay stick around and play pickleball you know so that our our language is play and then heirs heirs is our identity and we believe you know and have received you know jesus christ is lord so therefore we believe we are children of god and so that makes us heirs um and so i think it just Again, there's there's such a there's young people, and again, from the youth, from our campers, even to our summer staff age, um, and our support staff, uh, there's a hunger. There's a real hunger for truth, and they know they're not getting it. Uh, you know, as far as in their current, uh, you know, unless they're uh, unless they're queuing into the Finding Your Zone of Genius podcast, they're not getting. You know, they're just not getting, you know, things unpacked and unwrapped for them. So, yeah, I mean, and part of this podcast is about helping anyone, young adults, people coming out of college to listen to their heart and, you know, sometimes get out of your head. You know, I, I pray, I meditate a lot. And when I get out of my head and into my heart, I see life through a different lens. And my hope is that people do that and they 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 take inventory of how they're different and what god's gifts they have that make them unique you know make them different from their friends and then maybe try to align their career where you leverage those on a consistent basis um again i've mentioned it a couple times you know you took a 180 and you talked about cindy and you the timing which was just crazy uh but was it can you i mean I would have a hard time doing a 180. I mean, you know, being locked into a definition of success and, you know, growing up in Bellevue and just the pressures of comparing and like money. And I mean, you were on a trajectory like financially, which is not, that's not success, of course, but was, I mean, did you totally feel safe or was it an easy transition or was there still a little like, oh gosh, I hope I made the right decision? Yeah. All the above. I think, you know, that uh, certainly money is used as a measure of success. Absolutely. And the only thing I can explain it as really, Dirk, was just a change of heart, just like you mentioned, just this change of heart. And there was this shift in my heart. And, you know, again, being a man of faith, the only thing I can explain that as is, you know, that God shifted on my heart uh, and that it was time for me to you know, sell the business. Um, there wasn't like this crazy trigger event. I mean, you know, it, 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 other than just this, this changing of the heart. Uh, so yeah, so there was a little bit of a leap of faith that that took. 
Um, you're exactly right. I mean, being a co-founder of a very successful firm that had, had dramatic growth, um, you know, I had a lot of friends say, dude, you're either absolutely crazy or you have figured something out that, you know, uh, is going to blow us all away. So I, I'd love to believe it's the latter. <laughs> I don't, maybe uh, both, maybe both. <laughs> but maybe a little of both, you know, I'm okay with that. So it's, you know, it's, it's all the way I can explain it is just that, that shifting of the heart. So, um, okay. So like in getting back into what you do, which is a lot of things, I mean, you have, there's skill sets, a lot of skill sets that you have, but there's also, I mean, you have a, it's a big camp and there's a lot of logistics and there's a lot of like, I have a lot of podcasts with people who are super creative, but we get into the weeds on the business side of the business about making it work. Right. And so how difficult is that? Like, I, I know that you have strong teams and strong people around you, but the business of running a camp, how hard is that? Oh, it's extremely difficult. I mean, we're like a giant hospitality organization. Um, in the summertime, we serve uh, 3,000 campers, uh, served by almost 150 college age staff. Um, we also have a high school uh, work crew uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, you got a lot of people, a lot of moving parts. Over the course of a year, we'll entertain over 10,000 guests in our different retreat uh, type programs. So, yeah, so it's a lot of moving parts. We're a lot like a hospital, like a hotel almost, uh, or a resort uh, from a hospitality perspective. We have a, a dining hall that is uh, the the busiest actually kitchen in the months of July and August in the whole city of Bellevue. Um, yesterday morning, we actually hosted 120 men uh, for a men's breakfast that we do every single month. So uh, provided a a high school group that's here today with chili uh, or Philly cheese steaks, you know, so it's, there's, there's, it's a lot like the restaurant business as well. Um, and then of course you got camp in there. So it's uh, yeah, a lot of different moving parts. So the state considers us a large employer, um, even though I would still consider us, you know, a, a smaller employer um, for those business people on the line, you know, our annual revenues just exceed 3 million. So that's kind of where we're at as it relates to a small business. Um, which is a lot of fun. And, and the reason I love that, that area that we're at is even though we have 104 year history, we act a lot like a startup. Um, we constantly have to refigure and re-engineer and things are moving and changing so fast that we're constantly having to reinvent and be relevant uh, to the culture. So, but uh, it's extremely popular when we went live with registration this year in the first 10 minutes seven of our camps sold out, which was incredible. Within the first hour, 12 of our camps had sold out. And by the end of the day, we were completely sold out. So that, that tells you a little bit about the product, if you will, that um, people really love the name Sambika. I, I believe it's a gem in our community and kids love it. Just kids love it, you know? So um, we continue to just really receive very, very high marks, you know, from our surveys from the children themselves. So uh, we don't take any of that for granted, and we just continue just to want it to, to be a gem in the community. Um, like I said, youth these days need a place like summer camp. So, Yeah, I mean, by the way, I mean, if people who are not familiar with it, it's, you know, I think Washington is maybe one of the most beautiful states in the world. And then Issaquah, he's on Lake Sammamish, beautiful trees, beautiful water. Uh, I'm probably 20 minute drive where I live. So I get to pass it all the time, but it is beautiful. And it's, um, well, I can't imagine a better place to wake up and walk around and you also get some exercise because of those Hills. I mean, it's not, <laughs> if you're out of shape, you won't be for long. So, you know, I know you're a super positive guy, but I think it's fair just to kind of with any career. I mean, there's not every job has, uh, you know, it's not perfect. Right. So are there things that, I mean, I don't want to say things you can't stand about your job, things you don't like. What are the really tough spot? Like, I know there's great things like seeing the look on kids' faces, uh, just the smiles, the laughing, uh, seeing them again the next year. What are some of the things that maybe, hmm, I'm not so crazy about this part of it? Boy, that's actually a really great question. Um, you know, I, we've got wonderful people. So I'm so thankful for, uh, you know, for, for the team, the people that work here. Um, thankfully, we've got positive cash flow, which is 
you know, not what a lot of, you know, it's, you know, a lot of, it's a nonprofit. So a lot of nonprofits, that's the first place they go. Um, but thankfully we have very strong cash flow. Um, uh, great, I think a great strategic uh, outlook. Um, so probably the, the thing I would say, ah, it's an old property. <laughs> and so the thing that I'm always like getting frustrated by is uh, the consistency of things that just age and they wow. fall apart and they break down. And, and even though we have, uh, what I'm thankful for is strong cash flow, et cetera, there's nothing that can prepare you when literally a pipe bursts out of the ground or, you know, uh, a roof, you know, all of a sudden loses its integrity. I mean, uh, or a tree falls for that matter. I mean, you know, so <laughs> what actually happened this week? So, uh -huh. you know, so, uh, and then, you know, broke a fencing structure. So that would be my answer is it's very frustrating when, you know, you're having to write big checks and you're like, this was not in the plan. It was not in the, you know, it, not in the ball. We have to budget for those things, but those unforeseen things. But that's probably the biggest frustration is, and this, you know, it's just, again, it's a wonderful property, wonderful legacy, but things weren't always done the way they should have been done at, in the beginning, you know? So yeah, no, I get it. Beware, beware if you're building stuff with bailing wire and duct tape, it will eventually come back to, to bite. Um. I'm just thinking there's so many things I want to ask, like, as far as like downtime, like you're, when you're on, you're on, right? I mean, you have to be on, you have a responsibility to the children, the young adults, your counselors, the families, they're entrusting you. Uh, like, you know, I need my downtime, right? I need to check out some time and what do you have freedom to like unplug? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, Cindy and I just uh, had the joy of taking 22 um, uh, college and young 20s uh, over to the Middle East. We uh, visited Israel and we just got back, you know, like about 10 days ago. Uh, one of the things that really struck me is how well they observe Sabbath. And for them, Sabbath begins on Friday night and ends on Saturday night. Well, you know, Sabbath is, again, a man of faith is something that we try to adopt. And so I, I feel like we do a really good job of making sure that we take a, a day of Sabbath. And it's just for exactly that reason, you know, instead of working, that we're truly resting, you know, as God, as God himself uh, demonstrated, even though he didn't need it, you know, he rested on the seventh day and he modeled that for us. And he threw it in there as one of those 10 commandments. Um, and, it, and, it, and he specifically said, it's not that you know, we are, are made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is actually made for us. And what's key about that is, you know, we all have the choice if we want to observe it, but the strong recommendation is if you do this, um, you'll have the energy, you'll be, you know, well, well rested for the remainder of the week. And I, I would suggest that that's very true. And we've seen lots of books, you know, that uh, and scientific studies that validate that. So, but yeah, it's all there in the, in the first book. Uh, of the Bible. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I always joke with you and I don't know why I haven't sent you this movie. I yeah. love this movie. It's called Indian summer <laughs> and it's about uh, a group of friends that reunite after life happens and they go back to the camp where a lot of their memories were mm -hmm. made and it, and it, I don't want to ruin the movie for you, but it, uh, two people decide to make a life changing decision oh. and take, take over the camp. And it's powerful. It's a very powerful movie. And it reminds me, you and Cindy. And you know, the thing that people need to realize is, let's just say you're watching this right now and, you know, like sounds really cool. And the buy-in from your partner or your husband or your wife, it's like, this could be very difficult with, with unless you have buy-in. I mean, it wouldn't work in my opinion. So you have to, you know, you might have a dream of doing this, but my advice and Matt could give it better than I is make sure your partner or your husband or wife or whatever are on the same page. Cause there's probably times where, you know, like I want to, you know, I want to place, you know, in Lake Chelan or I want a bigger car or a, you know, or something and, and, or whatever, maybe I want to go on a vacation and I, I can't, cause I got camp. Like you've got to have buy-in, don't you? 
Yeah. And I think that's great advice. I mean, I think, you know, should you find that, you know, significant other and that person that you really, you know, enjoy, uh, I think you're exactly right that you, you know, it has to be a decision together, especially if you're taking on something like this, I will check out that movie. That sounds good. Um, and the, and the movie we always allude to is, uh, so I bought a zoo, which was, you know, an old, uh, Matt Damon and Charlie Theron, uh, film, uh, and again, it's like, what were we thinking? Um, but, you know, you, you know, you go through all the, the trials and the tribulations and the challenges. <laughs> and then in the end, you're like, oh, OK, I think it was worth it. So it absolutely has to be in conjunction. So I'm just thinking, are you sure it was Char- Charlie Theron and not Scarlett Johansson? I you, thought, know, you, you might be right. Yeah, <laughs> I that's, get all. <laughs> that's my that's my movie brain. I'm like I don't re- I don't remember her in that movie. Um, no, that was a great movie. But this I, I tell you, it's so funny. I was just thinking. I started telling you about this movie when maybe Betamax was becoming VHS. I don't even know how I would get you this movie in today's. I mean, I think I have to uh, Dropbox it to you or something. But um, anyway, it's a powerful movie. I mean, I really do think you and Cindy would love it. And it reminds me of you too. So, um, I mean, I have some standard questions as I we wrap this up, but is there anything, I mean, you know your world better than I because you've been in it for so long. Is there something I'm not asking that's crucial to, to someone understanding this career route that, that they need, like something that's at the tip of your tongue that you like, Dirk didn't ask me this, but this is something they need to know. Well, you know, you mentioned uh, gifts and, and I like to, I like, I, I truly believe that again, from that Bible context, that God has given each and every single one of our viewers, I'm pointing you viewers, uh, God has given each and every single one of you a gift. And, and some of you have more than one gift, right? And so I think as soon as you can, like really diving in, we spend a lot of time with our, our young people discovering their gifts. Um, you know, and, and so what is, you know, your unique gift? I mean, as you mentioned, so for me, I I believe I have three, um, I believe that leadership is a gift. Um, I believe I have a teaching gift and I believe that exhortation, which just basically means I like to encourage people that those three are my spiritually given gifts. Um, and so I think my recommendation would be is like, man, the sooner somebody can figure that stuff out then it really helps from a career career development perspective because they can say, hey, am I going to be exercising my God-given gifts? Um, that would also probably be the other piece to it is that, you know, um, it's worth it. it. It's it's worth, I think, um, pursuing, again, I, I'm, I'm the Bible camp director, so I have to say, you know, it's worth pursuing the faith component. You know, is it real? You know, is Jesus who he said he was? You know, is he that is he is he really he said he was Lord. So is he Lord? Is he really God? Was he just lying or was he just some crazy lunatic? So it's worth diving into. Um, And again, what I can give testimony to is that when Cindy and I 13 years ago read that that verse in the Bible that talked about being uh, living a life that is truly life, uh, making that change, even though, like you said, it didn't make any sense at all but we knew it was right on our hearts. I can, I can say, and I know she would say the same. Yep. Over the last 13 years, we've been living a life that is truly life. So that third thing that your skill set that meant, what was that again, that word? Exhortation. And you said it means what? It means I like to encourage people. So like inspire? Uh, a little bit different than inspire. I think it would be more of just like uh, encouraging the way I take it. Uh, personally to me is helping people become all that they were meant to be. So it's, it's a little bit different than inspiring because it's more of getting to know the individual, you know, uh, diving into some of those again, like what are, what, what's your personality? What are your, what are your giftedness? You know, that kind of thing. Hey, you know, just exactly what you're doing here, which is again, finding your zone. I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's like finding your zone of genius. That's totally what exhortation is. You probably have the same gift. So it's cool. I I love it. I, you know, I had a really interesting conversation with a guest today. um, And he was kind of not challenging me, but he was 
we're trying to get, he's trying to go deep on what he was surprised towards the end of the podcast. It, he thought it, it was, he loved it. And he it was like, this is different than I thought. And like, you know, I had a dad that was kind of scary and, and I would say in a lot of ways he bullied me mm. and I, so I've always wanted to take on the bully. And like, when I think of career and the machinery and the status quo and like the comparing and that race that people run that they never win, it makes me sad and angry that, and then I think about all the hours and minutes people spend in their careers and then they get locked in and then it's hard to get out, you know, the golden handcuffs or whatever. So I feel like it's not like the world is a bully or the society is, but mm. like, I just really want people to feel uh, brave enough and safe enough to listen to that voice and listen to your heart. You know, so much of our successes sometimes comes from being in our head. And I've learned a lot of times just through prayer and meditation that when I get into my heart is, you know, I see things a lot more clearly. So my hope is really to encourage as well as just to try to get people to take note of the obvious, right? It's sometimes really simple. It's sometimes right in front of you. And it's sometimes what you do on a Saturday for eight hours, it feels like 30 minutes. It's, you know, what you came in this world, you know, unique. I mean, that's, that's what I hope. And I know that my dad in heaven right now is like, son, job's a job. You're not supposed to like it. Just make money. And, you know, I just don't buy into that. I mean, some people don't care what they do, but I think there's a lot of people that want to have more joy. So that's my why. Um, enough of me. So two questions I ask: if you were to go back in time, coming out of UW, by the way, I've heard one of the fastest runners, base runners uh, <laughs> out there and one of the hardest working athletes. I mean, everyone always talks about you in such positive regard. Mm. Um, if you came out of UW again, knowing what you know, and I know the coin response is I would do it all again because it led me here. But would you have expedited your career route and gone into something like this? Uh, or would you have done it the same way? You know, I, I'm obviously very thankful for the path uh, that I would say that God had me on, uh, because what I realized is it prepared me greatly uh, to run the financial side of running a significant camp. Had I, dove, had I dove into camp right away, you know, if that had been the path, I definitely know I wouldn't have had the the, the know-how. Could it have been learned? I'm sure it can. Um, but I'm very, very thankful for, you know, the financial background, not only in understanding, you know, cash flow and financial statements, but also just in, in understanding a lot of different, you know, financial vehicles um, that the camp was uh, uh, able to take advantage of. So, so yeah, I would just say that, you know, at the end of the day, Again, like we talked about those early 20s, it's, it is all about guesswork. It is all about uh, a discovery. It's, it's figuring out, you know, boy, how do I, how do I even survive? Um, and that's okay. You know, I think that's an okay thing to be, as I reflect back, I, I'm thankful for that. Um, you know, and then, and then as I look back, you know, into my 30s, okay, in my 30s, now it was more about what are some of those courageous adjustments that I'm going to make. And for me, it was becoming an entrepreneur, becoming the owner of my own business, you know, uh, for the first time, you know, and, and eventually those did lead to success. Um, so I'm thankful to God for that. Um, but then by the time I reached my forties, well, now all of a sudden it's this camp thing and it is about negotiation of well, what's that kind of really perfect fit that's going to lead to significance. Um, now at this stage of life, um, you know, which is humbling, it's humbling to get to this stage of life, um, but it's exciting. And the exciting piece is, okay, now, now it takes boldness to really get into that right use, like we're talking about of those strengths. And that's all about legacy. Um, you know, so I, I think to a long winded answer your question, you know, I'm so thankful for the, the baseball playing. I, I wanted to be a professional baseball player as a kid, you know, and I'm so thankful for, uh, you know, entering the finance world. I'm so thankful for being an entrepreneur. I mean, 
life is all about experiencing, right? So it's like, man, it, it, to me, it's more about the adventure. You know, it's just like, can we honestly say that at this point in time, we're on this grand adventure? And if the answer is yes to that, then it's probably likely that we're doing, we're finding our zone. So that we're, we're in that place where we're supposed to be. So, Yeah. I mean, you bring up a really good point that I think, I mean, even if you're 35 and you're in a job that there's something to gain, like I would say, take full advantage of what you're doing. You know, like I'm, I'm a, I'm in the real estate lending business and I enjoy it. It gives me a lot of freedom. I'm really good at it. It's not my passion. I, I mean, it, I, I take it very seriously. And I think that people are lucky to do alone with me because I, I care a lot. Um, but like, you know, there's things that I get out, I mean, you know, even in what I'm doing here with the podcasting, I wrote a book, I coach people. Uh, there's things I got out of that business that helped me be better at what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And Matt brings up a great point is, you know, don't, don't get, don't beat yourself up. Maybe be brave, make a move, do what you got to do, but maybe there's something to gain uh, on where you're at now. And, you know, by the way, Matt, you could have always come sold long distance to medium sized businesses with Cindy and I, <laughs> you know, that was a lot of fun. Like, uh, I, I mean, I mean, that was a tough gig, but we, uh, I, I, you know, the story for the first six months, they didn't have a territory. So all we did is play volleyball and, uh, it was pretty good gig. <laughs> yeah, I love that a lot. That's too funny. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's you're never stuck. I think that's an important thing for listeners to hear yeah. uh, is you're never stuck. And it is all about finding that right fit. And that has to do with pace. It has to do with the place. Um, you know, it has to do with the work that we're doing. Do we find joy in it? Uh, is it purposeful? All those things. So, I mean, life really is a journey. And, you know, it's um, again, just as we got back from this adventure, I'm sitting on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, we actually went to all the different places, of course, you know, that that uh, Jesus taught his disciples and he was a masterful storyteller. And one of the things, one of the stories that comes to mind is him telling a, a story about a farmer. And he's sitting there on the shores of the uh, of, of the lake. It, we call it a sea, but it's more like a lake. And, you know, behind him are all these farms. And so he's telling the story of the farmer. And he says, you know, the first farmer or the farmer first throws seeds on the ground and they, they land on the path and the birds come down and swoop them up. And he says, you know, that's a lot like what Satan will do, you know, to, to today. Um, and then he says, and then some of those seeds fall in the rocks and they fall in the rocks and the, there's, they take just the, the root doesn't quite get very deep. So there's joy, immediate joy, but then the sun scorches it and it burns it up. Um, and he says that that's indicative of like when trouble or when persecution comes today. And then he said, you know, that some of the seed falls in the thorns and the thorns, the other thorns choke it up, you know, and he says, you know, it's the thorns are representative of the worries of this life or the deceitfulness of wealth or just the desires for other things, things that uh, maybe seem glittery and fancy, et cetera. But when you really discover it's just a weed, because, you know, think about all those NFL guys that they win the Super Bowl and then they're sitting on the bus, you know, afterwards and they're going, wait, is this, is this it? You know, I thought there was more, you know, we hear all those stories of that. But then he says the, the last seed falls on good soil and the good soil, then it produces, it grows and it multiplies in the crops. And he says 30, 60, 100 fold. And so that story just comes to mind is that that's my desire for all of the viewers and that finding your zone of genius is that, wow, become part of the crop that produces the 30, the 60, 100 fold, because that is inexpressible and glorious joy. So, Yeah, I love that. Um, that's really powerful. I think there was a book. My I had all these biblical books when I was a little kid. And I, <laughs> I remember I have this memory of seeds. It, I think it was the same story. Mm. Uh, brings back a memory as far as, okay. So one more question I ask, and mm. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but let's just say you couldn't do what you're doing now. Mm. You couldn't, you couldn't be a, a CEO of a Bible camp. Mm. You couldn't be a pastor. You couldn't, is there a dream job? Just kind of like something off in left field, like a 180. 
And I ask this question because it's always interesting for the audience to get to know you on a different level. You mm -hmm. know, like something, is there, is there something that you would love? I mean, professional baseball player, I mean, whatever. Is there something that you dream of or dreamed of or joke around with Cindy on that, God, I wish I could do this? <laughs> well, I know I can't be a professional baseball player anymore. So <laughs> well, you got to dream. You, you can. <laughs> no, I, I understand that, but <laughs> I just, I got to be realistic too on that one. Um, I mean, I, I, I really love what I do. I mean, you know, again, that's kind of that being back into that legacy place is that regardless of whether you're getting paid or not, do you find great joy in doing it? And so I really, really do find joy in what I'm doing now. Um, if pressed, if I were to say, okay, but you can't, it's not an option, it's off the table. You know, I think what would be fun, I think it'd be really fun to manage uh, a ball club. Uh, I think I would really, you know, coach Matt, that's the camp name. And I think I actually would really enjoy, I still love stepping onto a baseball diamond. I mean, there's something about the smell of the grass and the glove. And I mean, just the, the ball thumping into the, in, into the palm. I mean, man, when I, I got, I've had a couple chances to work with some kids, you know, just for, just for fun, you know, just to help them out uh, getting ready for the season and even just stepping onto the field and playing a little bit of catch. I mean, it's just, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that'll ever leave my blood. So I think to answer your question, I think it'd be a lot of fun, like to manage, you know, and, and so maybe there'll be an opportunity with the Mariners. I don't know. I mean, they're not off to a great start. So maybe, maybe a phone call will come in. We'll see. So if you were managing and I was your player was bottom of the ninth, I hit a triple two <laughs> outs. Would you have me steal home? <laughs> I would not have you steal home. <laughs> I was fast, Matt. <laughs> I'm sure you were, but you know, yeah, it's probably not going to work out well for us. So we need have to. You, make, have you seen gonna, that? Movie? We're going to we're going to exhort the number four batter in the lineup to just get a base hit. So <laughs> all right, I like it. Have you seen that movie, Stealing Home? I don't know if I have seen Stealing Home. It's so good, Mark Harmon. It's an old baseball movie. <laughs> uh, anyway, Matt, I I love you, brother. Uh, you are an inspiration. Uh, you know, you are an example, like of when you define success, like you are it. And yeah. I don't really know anyone who, who is loving, like you're so perfectly mm -hmm. situated in your career and mm -hmm. it's an inspiration. So I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're super busy. You got stuff going on. Um, thank you so much. Well, it's, it's a joy. And I, I love that we're actually filmed or, you know, doing the show on good Friday. And, uh, you know, again, as a, as a man of faith today, this weekend is an important day. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we were actually at the garden tomb itself. And uh, so what was cool was there's a sign in the garden tomb and it says, uh, he is no longer here. He has risen. So I think the last encouragement to all the viewers would be just, you know, that God does love you so much and has such a great plan for you. Um, that he obviously sent Jesus, that's what we're celebrating today, uh, to bear all of our sin on the cross. And uh, But if we believe in Jesus, we put our faith and trust in Jesus, um, then the promise is eternal, eternal life with God in heaven. And, and again, that inexpressible and glorious joy that lasts for all of eternity. So I know I'm sounding perhaps preachy, but I can't tell the viewers enough how much I love them and how much God loves them. And I hope they've gotten something, a nugget or two out of this talk today. And Dirk, you're doing a great service for our community. So thank you, brother. And again, just to a little embarrass you a little bit, rumor has it that Dirk still has a legend of being the camp crush in the light in the late eighties um, that all the girls, he was the camp heartthrob. So your, your legacy continues, my friend. <laughs> how old was I? I just curious, how old do you think I was when I was this heartthrob? Oh, I would say teenager, you know, so probably uh, <laughs> yeah, cause a young I, teenager, young teenager. Yeah. I think I peaked about 11 years old. So that sounds good. <laughs> <Yeah. about> <laughs> I love it. I All love right, it. buddy. Hey, thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me on the show. Take Thanks, care. Matt. Thank you. Bye.